Hi there. Welcome to Mushroom Hour. Today on Mushroom Hour, we have the pleasure of speaking with Merlin Sheldrake, author of the groundbreaking fungal narrative, Entangled Life. Merlin is a biologist and a writer with a background in plant sciences, microbiology, ecology, and the history and philosophy of science. He received a PhD in tropical ecology from Cambridge University for his work on underground fungal networks in tropical forests in Panama, where he was a pre-doctoral research fellow of the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. Merlin's research ranges from fungal biology to the history of Amazonian ethnobotany to the relationship between sound and form in resonant systems. A keen brewer and fermenter, he is fascinated by the relationships that arise between humans and more than human organisms. Of course, as a man of many talents, he's also a musician and performs on the piano and the accordion. Now, I'm excited to leave behind our anthropocentric lens of analysis and dive into the entangled realm of kingdom fungi to see if we can glean some more than human insights with a fungal wizard as our guide. Merlin, thank you so much for joining us on Mushroom Hour. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. The honor is all mine. I read your book and I actually read it out loud with my partner, which I think in parts a special kind of relationship with the book because you really understand it on a deeper level and it spawned so many questions, so many new ideas. You know, I consider this one of the best books I've ever read about fungi, combination of great scientific information and narrative storytelling. Uh, it's just incredible. So I'm so glad to have you on the show and be able to talk with you about it. But before we dive into all the great topics of the book, just a little bit, I know it's your life story, so it's hard to condense it, but a little bit of um, the early influences in your life that got you involved in nature and the sciences, and then maybe how you came to a fascination with fungi. Yes, well, that's a good place to start. I suppose I've always been fascinated by the natural world, in part, I think, because it's just intrinsically fascinating, but also because <laughs> my, my father's a biologist and an amazing student of the natural world and has always fueled my curiosity and uh, encouraged an interest in the lives that are lived around us and outside maybe our normal human sphere of engagement. So it's always, it's just been the way I've grown up behaving and thinking and so it was very natural for me to start being curious about how things change how things transform how things rot how things um, become one thing from another thing and these transformations that i became so puzzled by and i think as i puzzled so many people over so many thousands of years now how does this happen you know, what what oversees this process and and this obviously, this kind of inquiry, especially about decomposition, leads you straight back to fungi pretty quick. And so that's where mm. I first started thinking about these organisms that were invisible to me, or at least largely invisible to me, but which did so much. And I was struck in your book when you describe early life relationships with people like Paul Stamets, people like Terence McKenna, massively influential people, especially when it comes to mycology and fungi. And that's probably because your father's Rupert Sheldrake, and those were kind of his circles of, you know, luminaries at the time. Definitely. And, and I know he was great friends with Terence for many years, and they'd spend time doing their trialogues. And, and so we had to spend lots of time with Terence, which was obviously amazing. And he's, he's a, a very wonderful storyteller, as you'll know, as anyone will, have, will know if they've listened to him. And and his incredible voice and way of winding through narratives and, and sinuous thoughts. And so I was very inspired by him. And later on, I was very inspired by Paul as well and, and his amazing enthusiasm and, and fungal perspective and this, this lens. Now, everything comes back to fungi when you're talking to Paul. And, and, and it's <laughs> just a very astonishing and exciting, it's electrifying news flashes that he'd be spitting out. Every time I saw him, it's like new news flash, news flash, news flash. So he was a great inspiration too, yeah. Well, and so many people that get interested in mycology, one of those two is somehow influential in their relationship. So I guess it's impossible that you could avoid kingdom fungi with those kind of influences in your life. And that led you to academia and actually some rigorous work examining mycorrhizal fungi in 
Panama. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that because it is featured as a vivid narrative in the book. <laughs> so I went to Panama because there's a research station there, a research institute called the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, which is a very amazing place. And there's amazing facilities. And you know, if you want to be within a you know, five minutes walk of tropical forest, um, but then be able to come back to a lab with a minus 80 freezer, with liquid nitrogen, with centrifuges, with other specialized kit. You can really do this there. And so it enables all sorts of study that wouldn't be possible in other places. And also this amazing community of scientists who, many of them ecologists, and thinking about these remarkable ecosystems and all these different ways of being a living organism. So the diversity of life in the tropics was reflected in the diversity of these biologists. And they never... Uh, never got bored talking to them all about their various fascinations. I can just imagine the conversations that go on at that dinner table after a day of people out in the field. And it also comes through in the book how it is just this environment teeming with life. And here's Merlin crawling through the red mud, trying to trace tree roots to find fungal connections. Now, what was the organism that ended up becoming your main fascination while you were there and became kind of integral to your work down there? It was a mycoheterotrophic plant. And um, mycoheterotroph is an unlovely term, but it, it means <laughs> a plant that's abandoned photosynthesis and which makes its living by plugging into fungal networks and receiving its energy. So it's carbon compounds from these fungal networks, but also its nutrition and its water. And, and so they are ultimately receiving their nutrients from other plants through a fungal network. And then those nutrients pass into the body of these plants. And so they're, they're quite charismatic and they stand out, even though they're very small. And it's pale white. It's lost its green color. It's lost its leaves. Um, and just has a blue flower on top of the slender white stalk. And I was always fascinated by these creatures. And, and so they became very important to me because I was studying how these connections form with plants and with the fungi that live in the soil and, and because these mycoheterotrophs they have because they can't produce anything they can't photosynthesize they can't they have very restrictive root systems they can't harvest anything from the soil whenever you saw them you knew that biologically meaningful quantities of nutrients were passing from one plant to another and so i found that i treated them like periscopes into the mycorrhizal underground i think that's a great way of looking at it and another interesting part of your book was the idea that uh, you know, while the instinct is to see a mycoheterotroph as a parasite on the mycorrhizal network, I'm interested to see if further research finds some reason uh, or some way that they're actually giving back to the fungi that they're housing, whether it's just a better environment for these hyphae tips instead of rooting around the soil, they get a nice place to live inside the plant or something like that. I thought that was brought up well in your book. And that's a theme that I found throughout was kind of tempering our instinct to go to the extreme when examining any of these ideas and really see that there might be two sides of it. And, you know, that ranges from everything from the mycorrhizal network to psychedelics to all the different topics that get us so excited about kingdom fungi. I thought you did a really good job of tempering it with saying, well, some of these findings are in lab settings, some of these findings. And that's, that's important to remember as we dive in. But, you know, one of the biggest takeaways from Entangled Life was that interconnection between all organisms. I mean, the name of the book says it all, but the way you describe the interplay of bacteria, fungi, plants, as a biologist, how much of each different discipline of study of the natural sciences is really becoming a study of ecology? And, you know, how hard is it to separate studying individual organisms now with with what we know absolutely yeah it's a it's one of these really exciting thoughts to have it's one of these thoughts that can just open up onto further corridors of thought and get you dizzy before too long and i tell the story in the book of when i was in panama at this conference on microbes and someone was talking about a plant and they said we know these plants by these chemicals they produce in their leaves and it turns out that actually the fungi produce these chemicals these fungal um, symbionts, these endophytes that live in their leaves, produce these chemicals. So, so these chemicals, which were a distinguishing feature of the plants, are now actually produced by the fungal partners. And then someone said, well, maybe it's the bacteria inside the fungi. And then someone said, maybe it's a virus inside the bacteria, inside the fungus, and inside the plant. And 
this is really a you know the ground opens up and you realize that this is the case you know that that, that life is a story of symbiosis and it's all the way down and um, vir big viruses have smaller viruses living inside them this is a story of life and it's a story of intimate association collaboration collaboration being this fusion this this and this amalgam of cooperation and competition there's always tension it's not some utopian concept but intimate association um and so so many aspects of biology are becoming the study of these intimate associations and it's uh, i think it's very exciting as lynn margulies says the intimacy of strangers mm -hmm. and i think that's an amazing way to describe it uh, now, how do fungi in particular, why are they such a good model for symbiosis? Because that's another huge theme in the book. You, know, you talk about organisms like the amazing magical lichens and that great symbiosis of algae and fungi, uh, but it shows up in so many ways. So why are fungi such a good lens through which to examine symbiosis? Why do they seem to embody that so much? It's a good question. I think partly in the same way that they're such a good way to examine ecology because they, they live their lives as networks and so they form literal connections between organisms you know if you have right. the relationship between a pollinator and a plant you know they have this co-evolutionary history a very intimate shared history going back many many years uh, but they don't share the same bodily space all the time there's no physical connection between them that endures you know so when you have a fungal network it actually forms this enduring physical connection and so we can see that oh yeah we're talking about the relationships between organisms and this organism actually embodies that relationship between organisms it embodies <laughs> the principle of ecology because it forms literal connections and for that reason i think it's a good way to study many of these symbioses and also of course fungi have just played major roles in some of these the most blockbuster symbioses in the history of the planet so that's another that's another reason they just you know it's like one of those it's a, it's a usual suspect you know if there's some big event that's happened in, in on the planet then there's a good chance fungi have been involved. Of course, not all the time, but in many cases. So they are a physical symbol of the concept of symbiosis in one way, and they have actually been, through our findings of you know fossilized plants, they have been representing or executing symbiosis for hundreds of millions of years. And I love your description of how when algae first moved out of the water, they needed allies, and fungi were that allies that helped them navigate on land. And that brings us to those physical networks, the mycorrhizal networks, the wood wide web, as David Reed calls it. That's obviously a huge topic in your book. And I think it's a huge fascination for anyone coming to the world of fungi. It's that point where you realize that, yeah, there are these great macro fungi, these edible mushrooms, those are amazing. But the real star of the show is the underground network, the vegetative mass that's even acting as an internet of the forest. So many people, when they get introduced to fungi, learn that concept and it just blows their mind like it did for me. But how apt is that analogy of the internet? Because this is something you discuss in the book. How apt is that analogy and how are mycelium networks different than the internet? Yeah, this is a really big question. And and the wood wide web is a is a very convenient metaphor for us because we are familiar with the internet we're familiar with the world wide web and we're familiar with the ability of these networks to shape and reshape lives um, mostly our lives but of course the lives of the animals and the plants and the fungi that we live with so i think it's important as a kind of gateway notion when we're thinking about this but i think we need to be a little bit critical because the wood wide web uh, when we think of the wood wide web, we think of plants being linked by fungi. And so plants become the rooters, like the rooters in the internet, and the fungi mm -hmm. become like the cables. And of course, this makes the fungi kind of passive in that metaphor. So, you know, these cables are just the passive conduits for information being shuttled between the rooters. And in the case of the wood wide web, or in the case of these shared mycorrhizal networks, it's a totally misleading way to see it because these fungi, every link in a wood wide web is a fungus with a life of its own. And these fungi are active participants in this relationship and they're far from passive, passive cables that plants use to shuttle material between each other. So in many cases, it actually makes more sense to think of these fungi and the, uh, one fungus with a, a portfolio of many plant partners and to, to put the fungus at the center of your perspective rather than think about it from the plant perspective. That was a big switch that your book did was to think about not as a passive connection, but as an integral player with its own motivations. It's an active participant in the whole process. And we always think of the fungus as kind of equitably distributing food between the trees, but you know, it's not always beneficent. 
as is pointed out in your book, the trees may actually be using that to transport other things that aren't so good for other plants. Absolutely. And so there's so many things we don't know about what passes through these networks, right? So there's right. been these wonderful studies in controlled settings in pots where people have found that plants can, the plants, when they're connected by a shared network, they can receive information from other plants. So if a plant's been attacked by aphids and a plant that's connected to that plant, but that hasn't been attacked by aphids, can upregulate its defensive responses uh, in advance of the aphids arising because somehow a warning has passed through this network. And so this is astonishing, you know, and, and, and this, this has been found in a number of cases. But how that information is passing, we still don't know. Is it passing as a chemical? Is it passing as a change in bioelectrical activity? Uh, we don't know. And so there are so many things that we're unsure about. And I think it's very important for us to, to keep as much as we can to keep our minds open to these systems and how they work. And so exactly. So not, not deeming them just good, just bad. And of course, bad for who, you know, any kind of projection of these moral categories onto the natural world is wrought with problems and, and reflects our perspective more than the organisms that we are attempting to understand. But certainly I think it's important to think about these shared networks as no, kind of a utopian system you know and in many cases plants that share a network benefit from their sharing of the network but in other situations in different ecosystems plants actually small plants can be disproportionately disadvantaged by big plants by sharing a network and the big plants can extract more than their fair share and in these cases then small plants benefit when you cut the network and sever them so there's all sorts of ways wow. to play out and, and i think it's uh and depending on where you are of course because you know, there are so many ways to be a fungus. This is a vast kingdom of life. And, and the mycorrhizal lifestyle has evolved multiple times and can behave very differently even in combination with different plants and different settings. So I think that's also important to, to try to avoid to thinking about these systems as um, just as a stereotyped system. You know, there's huge diversity and it's good to remember this. Absolutely. And that idea that you can't always extrapolate findings just illustrates the need for more and more research into this. And I love that idea of these networks potentially being a foil for competition. And in your book, there was a gentleman, Kevin Beeler, who had mapped out a visual, a visual map of these networks. And you could see the bigger trees had far more connections with the network. And that's because the fungi were deciding, you know, which tree gives me more nutrients and I'm going to funnel more of what I'm collecting to that tree get more of the benefit and maybe starve out some of these smaller players that aren't going to give me as much. So definitely not passive, lifeless cables. <laughs> it gave, it gave a whole new, a whole new perspective. Now, how much do we have left to learn? Is this an area of research that you see is really one of the most important areas we still need to explore when it comes to fungi? Absolutely. And, and we're really just at the beginning of this area of research it's it's astonishingly young as a field i mean it's been around for and people have been since suzanne stimard's very influential work in the late 90s and david reed's work before that in the the late 80s this has been a field of study but it's only recently that we found that compounds other than nutrients can pass information can pass through these networks and it's um absolutely i think one of the things that will really continue to unfold in surprising ways as we devise new methods and techniques to study these networks in the wild you know it's yeah. all very well studying these systems in a lab but fungi live such flexible lives they their behavior and their biology their physiology and their metabolisms change so much depending on their context so when we're asking questions in small controlled systems it tells us definitely it tells us a lot but when we want to know what's going on in the bustling wilderness of the open soil in an old growth forest, you know, we have to look in the bustling wilderness of the old growth forest. <laughs> and it's really hard to look at these networks and how they shuttle things around in those kind of contexts right now. New methods are being devised, but we still don't really have the access that we want. Yeah, yeah. It's an interesting conundrum of how to study these things effectively in the wild. Now, one thing that I've been doing is talking about fungal decision making. You know, I talked about they're making a decision where to put nutrients when it comes to a forest, all that kind of thing. Fungi seem to have an intelligence or an ability for decision making. But, you know, in your book, you talk about 
not necessarily correlating it to a brain because that's the obvious analogy is to think of a giant mycelium network as kind of a nervous system. It's a brain without a body. Where does that apply? But also where does that kind of fall short and why is it, why is it prudent not to jump to the brain analogy right away? Yeah, it's, it's really important and really important in so many of our inquiries into the living world, whether fungal or not. Um, of course, we're predisposed to look for brains because we have them and we're proud of them. And, and, <laughs> and you know, our brains contribute to our species narcissism, uh, both because it's our brains that give rise to this narcissism in the first place, but also because we have these brains to be proud of. But it's hard to break free of this brain idea. And so it's actually sometimes hard to believe that you can have sophisticated problem solving abilities that have evolved in organisms that don't have obvious brains. So I think it's more important to think about what brains do. And of course, uh, there are many types of animal and many types of brain. So even within the animal world, the brain is a concept in flux right now. You know, So it's often more helpful to think about what the brain's doing. And often what the brain's doing is, is linking integrating information so linking perception mm. with action is one of the things that the brain does and if you think about fungal networks and it might be more helpful to zoom back to that level and say so you know how are they linking perception with action how is integration of information taking place and, and where are we seeing that integration and moreover how are they able to integrate information apparently everywhere at once and nowhere in particular and this is one of the big this is one of the big puzzling questions in fungal biology and also in plant biology too because plants are also decentralized organisms with indeterminate growth patterns and it is kind of that idea that you brought up where they're almost a colony of hyphae that functions as more of a hive mind where each hyphal tip is emitting chemicals getting responses from its environment and making decisions and then somehow passing that to the other hyphal tips in the network and something I didn't think of was how, you know, how is a mycelium aware of itself? Because it knows not to grow into itself. Uh, so it sounds like we have a lot to learn even about how information is being passed from those sensory tips of the fungal growing mass throughout the other parts. Absolutely. This is one of the really big questions in fungal biology right now is how do these networks coordinate themselves? And right. chemical signaling is, is a part. And we know that. And, and we know that that fungi have a number of ways of transporting things around their networks. They have flow. The river of cellular fluid or cytoplasm flows through these networks and is a major way for transport of water, for example. But substances can move in opposite directions at once in many cases. So the flow doesn't explain everything. And so there's these microtubules, so these molecular kind of motors, like a cross between escalators and, and scaffolding, and, and they can actively transport substances along these these scaffolds um, but that takes a lot of energy and it's quite slow so it's not enough still to explain some of this fungal coordination which seems to take place faster much faster than it would take right. for a substance to move from a to b so this is what has led people to suggest that flow itself might be a cue a developmental cue you know if you have a car braking system, a change in pressure can be felt simultaneously everywhere in the system. And that's how car brakes work. And it could indeed be how fungi transmits developmental cues around themselves by these coordinated changes in pressure or changes in flow. So these are all possibilities. And a very exciting possibility, which has come to light more recently, is that they might use uh, electrical signaling, waves of electrical activity um, analogous to the action potentials in our nerve cells uh, that pass down fungal hyphae um, in rhythmic ways and seem to respond to changes in their environment. So this is another exciting possibility and would provide a means by which they could communicate at these fast speeds, you know, speeds faster than you can transport something from one place to another. Well, and those electromagnetic forces within fungi have always been, it seems like from reading the book, a bit of an enigma. I mean, you look at Stefan Olson's work, the Swedish biologist examining bioluminescence and how he has this explosion of electromagnetic activity overnight from one of the specimens, I believe if I'm remembering the experiment right, overnight from one of his specimens gives this spike of electromagnetic activity and he doesn't know why. And so is it still a bit of a mystery how electromagnetic forces flow through the actual mycelium? 
So, so that, in that experiment, it was actually a wave of bioluminescence that passed oh, over okay. the fungus. But because you could see the bioluminescence passing over the fungus, you, you know that that's been coordinated somehow. So it's sort of the fungus making visible an aspect of its metabolism. So it was a way for him to see uh, visually that there's a, a rapid change taking place, apparently for no reason. And why? And why is that? So there are so many questions about this and how it works, but it's, it, we're really at an exciting time for the study of bioelectricity and this electricity as a signaling process. We've known about electrical signaling in animals for a long time, but it's also been known about in plants for a long time. And plants use analogous waves of electrochemical changes mm. to regulate their development and behavior. And so do bacteria. You can have colonies of bacteria and, and these bacteria behave almost like an integrated whole and you can have these synchronized waves of electrochemical activity which changes over the whole bacterial colony and seems to serve some kind of uh, regulatory role so even in organisms that are not formally multicellular you know that they're, they're single cell organisms they can come together and behave as a as an electrochemical whole in some in some regard so well basically it seems that as is clear you know if you think about it for uh, in an evolutionary way our brains didn't evolve their tricks from scratch. And these properties that we associate with our brains and our neurons, electrical excitability, these reflect very ancient processes that have been around in, in the history of life for a very long time before multicellular organisms arose. Absolutely. So it's less of thinking of the mycelium as a brain, but a brain is an adapted, compressed, and contained mycelial structure, maybe. Uh, contained, <laughs> contained within our vessel. I'm curious, have you ever read uh, Stephen Buhner's work, Plant Intelligence in the Imaginal Realms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have read it. Yeah, That was the only other book I've heard play with concepts like this about the idea of intelligence without a brain and a little bit about that human narcissism. And, and I love that idea because it stretches my brain's uh, mm -hmm. ability to, to process those things. And you add in uh, electromagnetic substances potentially passing through and then you add in some other strange things about fungi sensory perception like their ability to see color and it really in one way enforces that brain analogy but also just makes you wonder at the mystery of these organisms how are fungi able to see color because i marked that out in my book and it's so interesting how, do, how does that happen they have light sensitive pigments and mm. plants see color and animals see color and fungi also see color because this is such an important developmental cue you know for your behavior is different in the night and in the day and um, some fungi like the rice blast fungus it only infects plants at night and so that's its habit that's its style and the light the presence of life absence of light is a key part in, in signaling when to go about this behavior so it's yeah it's a, it's a similar biochemical process in all of these organisms and and, and fungi are part of that story but the, the compounds they actually use to receive light, there are the same compounds that are in an animal eye. So they have opsins, yeah, yeah. Which, which we have. And they use those to detect a, yeah, a range of colors. And, and they, I mean, we share, we share an evolutionary history with fungi, right? Where fungi yeah. branched off the tree. Um, they're closer in this deep evolutionary sense to animals than they are to plants. So Absolutely. many of these basic biological features we share with fungi, which is why yeasts have become such important model organisms in studying health and disease. You know, in modern biomedicine, baker's yeast has become this, it's this key model for studying many processes and then applying them later to humans. Well, and then yeasts have a long relationship with humans and our consumption of yeast has a long relationship with human evolution and cultural development. Uh, so why don't we talk a little bit about that? How long have yeast been with us? And how have they influenced human culture? Because there's a deep exploration of that in the book uh, that gives me a vast appreciation for yeast and their power. How have they influenced our culture so much? It's amazing. And I mean, the history of brewing is old, or much older than we know. We can be sure of that because it's something that happens by itself. There's evidence from the, the earliest incontrovertible evidence of human brewing is from about 9,000 years ago in China. But there's tentative evidence from stone tools found in Kenya dating from about 100,000 years ago. And it's probable that it's gone on much longer, you know, and, and the, the most, actually the most powerful evidence for this has come from analysis of our genome, where it's found that uh, an enzyme, you need to detoxify alcohol called ADH4, alcohol dehydrogenase 4. Mm. Without, it's without this enzyme, 
alcohol is very poisonous and, and we would not be able to drink it as we do we drink it and metabolize it as a source of energy as we do we forget that it's actually a we can break it down and, and burn it as a fuel so this enzyme is very ancient and it's thought that it has played a part in our ability to make a living on the forest floor rather than in trees by eating this whole new moving into this new dietary niche which is this overripe fruit which has fallen to the floor and by being able to to eat this fermented fruit and process its alcohol and burn this as an energy source we were able to go about the next phase of our evolutionary journey so actually these yeasts have left this imprint in our genome in the form of this upgraded enzyme um, which is which is a very amazing thought you brought forward that ancient lineage in such a amazing way a, a physical representation of that lineage of our ability to break down alcohol with overripe fruit at the end of the book with a story about your creation of this amazing apple cider now if you can tell that story just in brief i think it's a really great one and i think it's another way that you try to blend these really heady concepts and theoretical concepts and make them tangible and i think you do that throughout the book you find ways of making these things tangible to where you can touch them and somehow that enhances our relationship with these processes like fermentation so you know tell us about the story of newton's apple cider <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a long and tangled tale but i'll do a quick version but i'd been interested in this the drunken monkey hypothesis which is this idea that, that alcohol has played a part in our evolution by opening up new dietary possibilities and and I was also interested by the way that we talk about stories, you know, the way that we tell stories about yeast. And I've been brewing and, and from brewing from old recipes. And before we discovered that yeast were small organisms, which is in the 19th century, which was remarkably late. And we've been working with yeast without knowing what they are in modern biological terms. But right. that transformational force has been between being domesticated, it's been finely regulated. We've been able to produce fine wines and all sorts of drinks, but without knowing that, you know, which is amazing. So when you call it a god, a spirit, uh, whatever you do, we're still part of this working with yeast is, is managing this transformational power, whatever you call it. So I became very interested in the stories we tell about more than human organisms and, and the way that these stories change, the way that we see, think and feel. And there's this, these, these trees in, growing in Cambridge, the, these apple trees, which have been grown as cuttings from an old apple tree that grows outside Isaac Newton's family home. And if any tree dropped the apple that inspired the theory of gravitation, it was this tree. You know? But this story is, is no one knows if it's true or not because Newton left no direct account of the role of the apple in his theory. It was only right. secondhand accounts from people who said that they were having dinner with Newton and he mentioned the apple. So it's a story about a story. And I just thought it was so funny that these academics who are normally so indecisive and cautious, you know, when they get together in committees, the academic committees have decided to plant <laughs> these trees around town, but these academic committees were at the same time uh, denying that these trees, that the story was true. So the story was both affirmed by planting these trees. It was sort of affirming this, this myth, and at the same time being denied. And it was just so funny to me that, that a plant's involvement in one of the most significant theoretical breakthroughs in Western uh, intellectual I thought had been was here right here and it was shuttling in and out of fact in fantasy and i just thought it was hilarious a kind of clowning this plant was clowning for us and uh, being made to clown for us and it was just it was just all so so strange and so i thought this would be my fruit i'd get these apples and i make this into the cider and then i drink the cider and i get drunk on this cider and, and i'd be somehow getting drunk on this story and thinking about this story and these ways that we tell these stories about the more than human world and the effect that they have on it sometimes quite literally you know the effect the story that you hear about milk determines whether you end up with cheese or yogurt you know, the story you hear yeah. about grain determines whether you end up with bread or um beer so these stories matter and so yeah it was a kind of goof it was a way of just sliding down this helter skelter of, of story and, and touch and taste and intoxication well and it lets you participate in that narrative which is always so powerful when we can feel like we're joining this ancient history of fungal relationships in terms of the fermentation, much less the whole narrative of the human side of this with Isaac Newton's actual tree. Maybe you would experience some revelatory breakthrough from your ingestion <laughs> of this fermented 
apple that inspired Newton. I, I thought that was a really powerful story. And again, hints at that idea where we can physically interact with these stories and physically interact with these more than human, human organisms in a way that helps us understand it, even if it's not intellectually, but a way that gives us a, a kinship and a relationship mm -hmm. with these organisms. And fungi are probably going to play an even bigger role or more conscious role in human civilization moving forward in our story. And you talk about that in the book, some of the amazing ways that we find fungal solutions to human problems. Now, what are some of the examples of how we are employing our fungal allies to solve some of the massive kind of human created problems that, that we're facing on the planet? There are so many examples and one of them is a mycofabrication. So using fungi to, to build materials which can be used in construction of many things. So you can build composite uh, materials out of fungal mycelium and, and, and wood chips or wood dust, sawdust and, and corn stalks. And you can make building blocks, you can make boards, you can make packaging material, you can make a kind of leather, uh, you can make foam. And these, yeah. these substances which will then be able to decompose at the end of their lives, which can be produced in a matter of a couple of weeks on material that would otherwise be thrown away. And you know, I think of it as this as this win, win, win. You have the win for the waste producer because you have people taking the waste off their hands. You have a win for the cultivator of these fungi because they're getting these materials and a win for the fungi who are being cultivated to the exclusion of everything else and, and given this optimal conditions to grow. You know, you have this kind of, I think of them almost like giant termite mouths, you know, these humans as these termites cultivating these fungi in vast production facilities. And... and <laughs> It's always fun to think about who's domesticating who. But nonetheless, this fabrication, this is one very important and exciting, fast moving field as well. And then there's, you know, we've recruited fungi to break things down for us for millennia, yeah. you know, and you have miso and you have only ferment alcohol. We're, we're recruiting a fungus to, to digest something, to undergo a form of transformation and um, to oversee a transformation in the world around us. And so in this spirit, using this principle, there's, the field of microremediation hopes to deploy fungi to help break down or transform or uh, sequester some of the poisonous compounds that we've released into the environment through our carelessness and our hastiness and our disregard. And this is also an area that shows a lot of promise. And fungi can digest anything from used cigarette butts to crude oil to the herbicide glyphosate. And it's possible that if we learn to work with these fungi and learn to devise systems where we can provide for the fungi not only these toxins, but also the other things that they need to grow and make a life somewhere, that we'll be able to use these, develop relationships with fungi that will help us to detoxify the planet, parts of the planet. Well, and there's another great example in the book of you making that relationship physical when you go into a compost bath. I had never heard of that before. But this idea that you're actually communing with the fungi in a living compost pile. What was that like? And where did, where were you able to do that? In California. Perhaps no surprise. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> That's where um, I am. So perfect. Uh -huh. Well, you should go. It's called the um, Osmosis Spa and Sanctuary, I think. And it's a fantastic place run by a very amazing man called Michael Stasser. Oh, and fantastic. I heartily recommend it. And so it's, it's a Japanese tradition. And and so you're buried in these fermenting, these decomposing wood chips. And there's, there's a lot of bacterial activity there because they actually inoculate the wood with a bacterium. But these wood chips are piled into a heap and you know, left in a damp heap for a couple of weeks. And in that time, there's going to be a whole microbial flora thriving, including the beginnings of this fungal degradation, these white rot fungi. And so what you're feeling is this a decomposition is a kind of chemical burning. It's a chemical combustion. And yeah. when you're lying in this hot bath, it, it feels amazing in the sense, you know, if you like hot saunas or if you look at other types of hot springs, or, then it's a bit like that, but it's this strange sense of it being not liquid. And the strange sense of this heat being generated actively there and then by these organisms. And so you're feeling directly, you're immersed directly in the thermal consequence of this metabolism. And it's quite a powerful experience if you, if you like thinking about decomposition. And you've elucidated it beautifully in the book. And even that sense that you said of losing the boundaries of your own body, and kind of <laughs> falling into this combusting fungal network that's decomposing this material. 
And of course, when we think of fungi, we also, in common American culture, the number one thought is entheogens, which also break down that barrier of self. So maybe that's just some process inherent in fungi, whether we're ingesting them or just thinking about them, where we lose our sense of self and our own biological boundaries. But in that conversation of how they've played a role in our story and affected human development, you know, how central a role have entheogens played in the human story and also in some of your exploration into kingdom fungi? Well, you know, that's a, one of these really big questions is how, how deep and how important is our relationship with these entheogenic plants and with fungi? And the answer is that we don't know and we're not going to be able to know how, you know, and this is deep time <laughs> stuff and evidence is patchy and, and, it's unlikely that knockdown evidence will come to light, although who knows? So it remains a source of puzzlement and speculation and great fun to, to imagine, to think about this. And, and we know that many different cultures have used psychoactive substances as medicines and as a recreational experience giving substances and also as ways to solve problems, to find lost objects, to solve illnesses. This is obviously an ancient human fascination and, 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 and goes back. I know lots of animals, of course, would also choose to take these substances and get high. So it's, it's, it seems like this is a, a basic urge. Um, yeah. quite how long humans have been doing it, we're not going to know. Of course, Terence McKenna was very fond of this stoned ape theory, right? Um, stoned ape hypothesis. We, might we all love the stoned ape theory. <laughs> I want to believe that mushroom eating apes created our modern humans by activating our brain. <laughs> I mean, there is this big mystery to, and that's why Terence began, where he's like, well, look, we have this big mystery of the human neocortex. And this arises about three million years ago. It, it arises, it, it turns into this very densely packed, large, um, organ compared with other organisms our size and even larger and smaller ones. And how did this happen? And so he posited, of course, that the eating of these psychoactive mushrooms, which had triggered this, massive boom in brain size and, and with recent studies it's been shown that psilocybin does trigger nerve growth you know so it triggers a neurogenesis and could this have played a role well it might have done but but there are lots of questions that remain and one of them is i was talking with dennis mckenna terence's brother not long ago and i was like well well we're talking about language and, and he was talking about the importance of psychedelics in, in this synesthesia and the role of synesthesia in, in, in developing a symbolic language because in a symbolic language we have to say something and experience another thing. We have to have a, um, a, a kind of experience which is not just an experience of the sound of that word. It's more right. than that, which is a kind of synesthetic phenomenon. And and so Dennis talks about the importance of psychedelics for, for language, but of course, many organisms have a kind of language and, and, you know, birds have a language, you know, cetacean mammals, whales and dolphins have a language. And so I was teasing Dennis that, you know, if we have the stoned ape hypothesis, then we also need the stoned bird hypothesis and we also need the stoned whale hypothesis <laughs> to explain how language could arise in all these different parts of the animal kingdom. And, and so then he made the point that, of course, there is something special about human languages and mm -hmm. that, that these mushrooms could have played a part in, in developing this kind of abstract reasoning and this thinking. So anyway, it's, it's a point of much discussion and it's, I think, very important to think about it. And it's very fertile ground for learning about ourselves and, and learning about the ways that we might change in the future as well. And I love your ability, again, to temper these kind of ideas and ground them a little bit to explore these amazing possibilities that we kind of all are fascinated by, but then to ground it with you know, what are some of the scientific realities and some of the ambiguity that lies there. Another huge part of your book is something that I obviously am a symptom of, and that's this movement of amateur mycologists, radical mycologists, citizen scientists, whatever you want to call it, people that get into mushrooms, get into mycology, a lot of times through the micro-remediation vector that you were talking about. But what do you make of this growing community of citizen scientists around mycology and maybe why is mycology a field that seems to inspire so much of this amateur fascination passion and then drive you know physically doing these experiments and growing mushrooms why why how does how do mushrooms have that power <laughs> it's a really good question i think it's so thrilling this very fast moving field of these and um, amateur i use amateur in the and then never as a derogatory term you know it's from that right. latin i love it's it's about passion it's about uh, devotion it's about 
deep curiosity, a vocational curiosity with something. And I think it's thrilling to see these very fast moving organizations. Yeah, it's a, it's a thrill. So why funky? It's a good question. So we have amateur um, researchers in all aspects of science you know, until, and it was only in the, in the, no, the 19th century really that that science started to become heavily institutionalized and uh, professionalized mm. in this way that we have today. So much of science is driven by amateur inquiry you know, and the existence of passionate amateurs has always been a part of scientific innovation and scientific discovery. And so with mycology, because mycology is a relatively young discipline as a separate field because fungi only acquired their independence in the taxonomic terms in the 60s right they were part of the plant world before that and so there are departments of plant sciences maybe a dusty corner of the department of plant sciences would have a, a bit of fungal going on but right. on the whole fungi haven't had their own university departments like that plants have like animals have and so there's been much less professional institutional arena for fungal inquiry than there has for the other types of biological inquiry which has meant that actually much of the progress in mycology has come for a longer time from amateurs. And so it has a rich tradition. And um, and this is a kind of carrying on of that tradition. And, and it's really amazing. Of course, it's part of this bigger turn in, in the life sciences and in science in general towards these uh, sort of crowdsourced participation in scientific projects or citizen science. Um, and, and we're seeing these changes happen in many branches of science. It's very exciting. And you talked about your first instinct when approaching these communities at that radical mycology convergence, where you thought, how can people without the big funding and the complex equipment, how can they really have an impact? But do you think the tools are available at this point for citizen scientists to have an impact? And do you see them as really being able to push the boundaries of mycology or really any natural science research in a meaningful way? I mean, as much of a push from this group as comes from academia. Absolutely. And I was, I was doubtful at first just because I'd come from this very academic uh, context and I was used to having sterile benches and expensive kit and working in labs with doing things that I wouldn't hope to do at home. I mean, at home I would cultivate fungi, but in, in a more kind of rustic way. Um, right. But one of the things that Peter McCoy makes so clear, you know, Peter McCoy is such an amazing thinker and organizer and, and a sense maker of these organisms. And, and he, points out that these that hippie three you know the story of hippie three and the injection port method which i love that yeah. this way of inoculating liquid medium with with fungal inoculum using a syringe and a modified jam jar and this means that you can do this kind of more delicate mycology just in your open kitchen you know, when you're sitting there drinking a beer and and so you have lab results without the lab as peter says and i love this idea this um, and so we can really see in these cases that this, these amateur, so-called amateurs, are really driving innovation because as we learn about cultivating different strains, different strains are, are strange and, and it requires a kind of, you have to really get to know them. You have to have a feeling for them. You have to you have to just get things right one day and they will just be passionate enough to keep going. And a lot of the ways that we've learned to cultivate these more recalcitrant fungal cultures have come from this kind of dedicated and passionately curious and non-professionals. And so I think that's another area of great promise and progress. I had this idea when I was talking with, um, I was at one of Peter's cultivation courses and he was talking about these different, his experiments with strains of pleurotus growing through uh, the herbicide glyphosate. And mm. some of the strains grew up to the edge and grew all the way through it and no problem. Some of them grew up to the edge of the drop of glyphosate and waited for ages and, and then eventually grew through the, the glyphosate. And some didn't grow through it at all. And so I had this idea we really need more work on this. And I thought it would be great to have a kind of a contest every year with you know, a million dollar reward. Let's start with a million dollars and have all these micro hacker uh, enthusiasts come and bring their, their killer strains to fight <laughs> their way through these deadly cocktails of poisons and compete for this re reward kind of a race. And we'd learn so much that way and have this big incentive. So that's one idea that I'm, I'm floating around at the moment. I hope we see that because I know there are a lot of cultivators and citizen scientists who would love to get into that competition. And, you know, obviously it's something I talk on my show a lot about, something I'm very enthusiastic about. I see this huge wave of change that's possible and it's getting more people interested into science. Mushrooms, for whatever reason, seem to be really cool or capture people's imagination and seem to be an amazing vector for people to want to develop that relationship with science. 
So it just made me so happy to see such a big chapter in your book talking about that <laughs> and really playing with this idea. Now, I know that we're not going to be able to get into it fully, but what are some ways that we as humans may be able to use imagination or what are some ways where we can see through a more than human lens rather than an anthropocentric lens? And what are some of the advantages to that? Because it's a huge running theme throughout your book. Yeah, it's this, it's such a big question. And I think it's one that we really need to take on enthusiastically, willingly. So on the one hand, you have this tendency to anthropomorphize, to project human characteristics onto the more than human world, to try and make sense of it. Make sense. That's how we make sense of ourselves and our closest relationships with other humans. And so why would we not use these same terms to make sense of other organisms? But of course, that can come with a trap because uh, the potential trap of, of smothering the other organisms with human categories and so not being able to appreciate these organisms on their own terms. And for that reason, anthropomorphism is treated with great suspicion, as it should be, I think, treated with suspicion. But there's a problem that comes with that too, because what you often find is that there's such a strong a taboo against anthropomorphizing the world that instead we mechanize it. Everything mm. becomes blind a mechanisms behaving according to machine metaphors, and which, of course, is no less anthropocentric. Humans are the only organisms to make machines. You know, this idea of a, of big machines in the world of life, life living organisms, machines. This is a, this is a very anthropocentric way of thinking. Um, and it gives us the illusion that we've purged anthropocentrism, but obviously we haven't that way. So I think there's a way to return to these organisms as living organisms in the world, you know, behaving as these creatures that have evolved in their context to behave and then, and to create their lives in these astonishing ways, but without smothering them with innuendo and human categories and what that process is i'm not sure but one person i've been very inspired by is robin wall kimmerer and she talks about the um, indigenous uh, potawatomi language and she's part of the potawatomi nation and in this language there's a lot of verbs you know when you describe a hill the hill is actively being a hill it's hilling you know she describes this <laughs> as a language of animacy and i think this way of introducing processual feeling to change and and this this sense of um, action and doing and agency back into the way that we can describe the modern human world is really important. And I think there are some new linguistic tools or words or terms that we're going to have to start playing with to make that happen. I'm not sure exactly what those look like right now, but I do think this is a really important field of inquiry. And it gets you thinking so much about how we do place that bias on things. And of course, we're in a time where people are becoming more and more conscious of bias, of our projections onto other things. And the natural world is a huge part of that conversation that comes up in your book that really got me thinking, especially when you're talking about fungi, which are these organisms that seem to break down all these different biological barriers we make in our heads. What One quote that stood out was uh, Nicholas Money saying the concept of fungal species should be abandoned because we can't even separate them from each other. It definitely seems like we need a new linguistic toolkit to talk about these and conceptualize these differently. Well, we've just scratched the surface on the topics in the book. You know, there's such a deep, rich, not only scientific litany of knowledge, but also an incredible narrative and storytelling from your truffle hunting out in Italy. You know, so many great stories that keep you engaged and references to amazing scientists that you can further research are put in there in such a great way. It's, it's, it's a joy to read. And I really encourage anyone listening to this podcast, if you listen to Mushroom Hour, you need this book. It needs to be part of your library because it informs so many areas of the conversation around fungi. And I just need to know what inspired you to write this book? I mean, what made you think you needed to share this with the world? It was strange, really. You know, I, I never, I didn't have a, I never had a long ambition to write a book about fungi, but it kind of found me in this funny way. Some people suggested I write a book about something, and then I thought, what? And then I thought, why, why not fungi? Because that's what I think about all the time. So it sort of, it, it happened in step by step, but, but it really felt like, like it found me, and, and it was a, a wonderful adventure, you know, and I had to explore all these different areas of fungal inquiry. And, and it was fascinating to talk to people in these distant corners of fungal inquiry who weren't really talking to each other a lot of the time. 
and they'd say, well, what are people doing over in that corner of fungal inquiry? And I'd, have to, I'd explain a little bit of what they were getting up to. And, and then I'd explain a little bit of what this person was getting up to to them in the other corner of fungal inquiry. And so there was this um, really amazing sense of experiencing the nearness of so many of these uh, researchers, but also the distance of so many of these researchers. And, and actually that this is a large realm of fungal inquiry and so many different cultures and cultural methods and um, societal structures and you know from these amateurs to the professionals to everyone in between and it was really exciting to to think about human how humans think about fungi yeah and it makes a lot of connections in our brain that i didn't make before from looking at these individuals and it sounds like that was very much very much the process where can people get their hands on the book and where can people follow your work so my website is merlinshelljake.com and you can also follow me on instagram and twitter which are, you can find those links on my website. And the book is available at all major retailers, but I'd encourage you to go to bookshop.org and where mm -hmm. you can support indie sellers. And that's a really good way to connect with indie sellers and get it through with avoiding the beer moths. So that's what I'd suggest, bookshop.org. But failing that, you can get it wherever you'd normally get your books. I love that idea. Support the indie booksellers. A couple final thoughts before you leave us that I ask most of my guests just to get a little more insight into who Merlin is, what is a mushroom that you love or just a fungi that you love that we should know about and why? It doesn't have to be a favorite, anything like that. Just one you want to share. It changes all the time, of course. Um, how could it not? But one uh, recently uh, is a uh, Penelis stipticus. It's one of these bioluminescent mm -hmm. fungi. And it's also one of these ones that Stefan Olsen was studying and, and was observing these pulses in. But I was just thinking about bioluminescent fungi the other day and it just, just a little bit in the evening. And I was it's, a, it's one of these great examples of how, how much of the fungal world hides in plain sight. You know, there's glow, they glow in the dark mushrooms, you know, <laughs> this is, <laughs> they're glowing in the dark. And yet we don't know why they glow. And, and it still remains this big mystery of why there are various different reasons of why they might glow, but there's no convincing knockdown, um, reason for this very conspicuous trait. So, so I think of this, these bioluminescent mushrooms and panellus stipticus as this, they remind us of how little we know and how much there is to be learned about so many of these astonishing, um, very visible phenomena in the world. And I love how you pointed out that Penelope Stipticus was the candidate to be the original dial on a periscope in the first submarine. We're talking Revolutionary War era. Uh, I thought that was fascinating to think they knew about that back then. Amazing. Oh, um, the big glow in the dark mushrooms. I mean, how, how, could, you, you know <laughs> how could you ignore them? And then what has a relationship with fungi? given to you i mean how has it affected your development as a person obviously you're completely inoculated but what has this relationship given to you i think it's made it easier for me to to find comfort in uncertainty there are so many wide open questions in the study of fungi and one has to quickly learn to feel comfortable in the space created by open questions and this can be disconcerting sometimes you can get a kind of agoraphobia that can kick in and so by trying to stay comfortable in these open questions, by learning to stay comfortable in amb ambiguity, at least more comfortable in ambiguity, I can't say that I'm always comfortable in ambiguity, but fungi have helped to loosen some of my impulsive need for certainty and sureness and definiteness. And I'm very grateful for that. I feel like I'm a more, that I'm a more curious, open-minded human for studying fungi. Wow. Well, and I think it has that effect on a lot of us. You just put words to it beautifully, but I think it has that effect on, on a lot of us. Uh, and then what is the lasting impact that you hope to make with your work? Oh, that's so hard. Well, I don't really know what my work's going to be in the distant future. So, but in the recent past, my work has been writing this book. And so I've just hoped the book that, that it can help to open up some of these worlds, these hidden worlds, um, and to open up questions and open up curiosity and, and a curiosity with the way that the living world happens, the way that how nourishing it is for us to take an interest in the living world and, and the way that it happens and the way that these many lives come into being and pass out of being. And so it's really, I hope that it can inspire a desire to learn more and I think really as a species, that's this one of the things we could do with because some of the biggest problems that we face and the biggest violences that we proliferate come from a sense of already knowing. 
the answer of already knowing mm. what something is of being unwilling to to hear it or to listen to change so if i can contribute in any small way <laughs> to building <laughs> curiosity then i would feel like i've done as best i can I definitely think the book encourages us to listen more to the natural world. And actually my partner and I likened it to almost a psychedelic experience where it kind of breaks down your different boundaries and gates of how you see the world and opens things up to all these new possibilities. So, you know, I highly encourage people get the book. It's an amazing, uh, I think seminal work. And thank you so much, Merlin, for being willing to come on and share yourself and insights about the book with us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure.